Hello everybody, uh, Patrick here, so uh, with a little short video uh, explaining to you how to answer the questions for the essay. Now I know some of you have got your your drafts coming up uh, the next week I think it is. Um, so I just wanted to give you uh, some advice on each of the questions, explaining maybe how to answer them uh, more specifically. Um, now, I know a lot of you won't be doing this question, so what I suggest is you skip forward to the one that's uh, relevant uh, to you. Um, also, uh, I think I'll try and repeat what I say now, just so everybody can hear it. Uh, in terms of doing well in the philosophy of religion essay, I mean, firstly, look at the, sort of the, 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 uh, the marking criteria on now. But in summary, try to remember that to get your uh, low to one, uh, I think I've <laughs> I think I've said it to you loads now at this stage, but uh, just so we have it here uh, for posterity, what you need to do to get a low to one is basically to, you know, describe the concepts that you, of the philosopher that you're engaging with. That's the most important thing. If you can do that, if you can do it clearly and if you can do it well, you'll be put yourself in sort of low to one territory, which is where we want you to start, basically. But obviously, we want you to get higher and higher and higher, but that's that's a, that's a good place uh, to start. So, you know, the high two ones of the world would, would, would try and do that as well. Sorry, the high two twos of the world, I meant to say. They would uh, do that as well. But I think what would be... What's, well, what, what defines that sort of a, a high two two is like... It is descriptive and it is generally accurate, but it, there might be some inaccuracies. It might be inaccurate. It might be not so much critical uh, material. So, you know, low to one, describe the core concepts and try and, uh, you know, be, be thorough and be clear and, and, and write it well and, you know, have all your referencing and stuff like that. That's kind of sort of the bread and butter, you know, answer. Um, to get higher then, you know, to get into your mid-2, say mid-2-1, then you're starting to describe what critics would say of whatever philosophy you're doing. Say if you're talking about Freud or something like that, you would, you would, you would have a, you would, you would, you would, you would have to research some uh, critics on what Freud would say. Or if you're doing something on Nietzsche, say, I don't know, you would look at what Bertrand Russell has to say about Nietzsche and how he would uh, criticise Nietzsche's position, for example. So it's basically a low 2 one plus good clear description of the of the of 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 of, of sort of critical uh, sources both for and against uh, then moving sort of to the higher two one you're going to be need to to sort of start evaluating things you know you're going to have to sort of give arguments as to why well one thing that really defines sort of the high two one is that it's you know it's 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 got a it's it's got it answers the question which is the thesis you have a thesis and their thesis is basically an argument which will answer the question posed so if you look there at uh, the first question here according to Jung we're all unconsciously motivated to seek God why did he say that do you agree so you can, the 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 answer is almost there you can see why did he say this uh, and he's saying you're going to give the reasons so you're going to describe what Jung's philosophy of religion is how his uh, theory of the unconscious relates. Uh, to philosophy of religion and then you're going to say is this tenable does this make sense what reasons do i have for saying this uh, who would agree with me? who criticizes young who 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 thinks young has got something to say about this right and then you give justifications for your answer which is do you uh, agree but um i guess what separates the high two one then from the first is that the first has got everything going for it you know you know, maybe a high two one might have something missing. Maybe the sort of the referencing is loose or maybe the sort of the argument isn't worked out as well. You know, maybe it's not, there's non sequiturs, maybe it doesn't, you know, it might be good for the most part, but there might be, you know, it might be a bit un, but a bit uneven. And I think what really sort of defines the the, 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 the high first, or sorry, the, the, the low first, right, for, to get in there is that there's a continuity through it, right? You know, there's, the thesis is referred to in each of the different sections. The, or I, or the argument and that means that you know it's uh, the, each of the different sections that you do are you know they're not self-contained there's a there's a coherent and unifying narrative all the way through them and they link together uh really 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 well so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to go through each of the questions and um sort of try to give you some pointers and tips on how you might go about answering it now you know there's no real one way to answer a question but 
these are the things that I would recommend you be hitting when you're constructing your answer. So first we'll start with uh, question uh, number one. Uh, according to Jung, we are all unconsciously motivated to seek God. What did he say about this? Right? Why did he say this? So the, uh, the, 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 the key word there is unconscious, right? So what you're going to have to do is explain what Jung means by the unconscious and explain his general uh, philosophy of religion. What does he say about archetypes, uh, for example? Uh, Jung thinks that we have a sort of a, an inherent religious disposition. That's what the unconscious ultimately is. And uh, you're going to need to try and explain that. Uh, you know, you need to try and explain what Jung is uh, talking about. Uh, then, you know, I guess, see the second part of the question, why did he say this? Well, I think the answer to that is straightforward enough. He, he, he thought that because his... Uh, his uh, his version of psychoanalysis led him led him to see that he kept seeing all these different archetypes emerge again and again and again and uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, in 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 class he was he was he, he thought that you know that we sort of the human being has got this sort of in, inherent religious disposition this disposition towards the uh, sort of the mystical or the spiritual or the mythic OK, so try and uh, hit all of those and then say if he's uh, do you agree? Um, OK, now, Freud, uh, question two, Freud compared religion to neurosis to the extent that the religious be the religious believer even must be seen as psychologically unwell. Now, Freud obviously is the gives the he's more sort of critical of religion. Right. So. He compared religion to neurosis. Now, the thing with Freud is that there's so much about him, you really are going to have to focus on the core text that Freud talks about religion. Right? You don't need to go into all the other things. You don't even, to be honest, you don't even need to to, 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 to read all of the of the texts where he talks about religion. Although it is going to be important in that answer to consult the primary texts. So uh, I think the primary texts there are uh, The Future of an Illusion. This goes for all the Freudian questions. The Future of an Illusion and... Oh, what is it? I think it's Moses and monotheism, and um, uh, civilization and its discontents. Right. So, what? In a sense, I think the the, the key word there is uh, neurosis. So the opening section should really be on what Freud has to say about neurosis, as it explicitly links to the question of religion. Right. To the question um, of the religious uh, believer. So I think the idea there is that Freud thought that, you know. Religion was like almost like a sort of an obsessive compulsive sort of uh, neurosis, you know, sort of these sort of irrational and um, repeated rituals, right? And in a sense, he thought that that was um, that that was a form of sort of psychological immaturity or sort of, I guess, cognitive dissonance, if you like. And you will need to explain all of that in the answer. Um, I mean, I think the 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 whole point is that. Um, for Freud, you know, he thought that religion was a sort of an almost infantile form of wish fulfillment. You know, we have this desire for there to be a good God, a sort of a God, the father, a patriarch. And we have this sort of childish desire to see the universe as wholly benign and, and, and good. And uh, for Freud, Freud is sort of a very tragic thing. He doesn't, he doesn't actually think that. He doesn't think that, you know, you know, we're always sort of uncon motivated by unconscious desires. So... That's the important thing uh, with that question. And the last question is critically evaluate this claim. I mean, there's different ways you can you can you can evaluate that. I mean, a lot of a lot of uh, sort of a, a lot of more sort of empirical minded and scientific philosophers uh, dispute Freud's claims, saying that he is uh, you know that he's kind of there's no such scientific objectivity to it. So you could you could go down that road. Um, you could maybe question whether Freud's uh, analysis of religion is overly pessimistic or maybe it's uh, inaccurate and you could you could uh, you could perhaps you know go through the different concepts and see whether they're tenable what you know what are you talking about the unconscious neurosis oedipus complex however you choose to answer it so that's question two now question three is an interesting one these are these are Neil's questions, right? And you have to sort of compare and contrast Freud and Jung's theories of religion. So again, there you're going to have to, as you know, it's kind of a sort of a mashup of uh, question one and two. This you're going to have to do the same things. You're going to have to explain what Freud's. You're going to have to give a good detailed summary of what Freud has to say about religion, as I already said. 
and you're going to have a good detailed summary of what Jung has to say about religion. Now, I think that would be um, the obvious thing to do with that would be sec Freud section one, Jung section two, or, or vice versa. Um, so you have to make the comparisons. So where is there overlap? That's what the question is answering. So comparison is a key word, and that would be that could be section three and uh, the contrast. What are the differences? Now I think the obvious difference between Freud and Jung is on the question of sexuality. Freud thought that uh, sexuality had a huge role to play in our well in our understanding of everything really, but in what you'll have to talk about is how it, how it relates to the question of religion. Um. And then you're going. Jung thought that it was, um, well, Jung thought that the unconscious was was more a sort of a manifestation of our religious desire, our religious disposition. He thought that Freud overplayed the the. Uh, the he thought that Freud overplayed the, um, the, the the sexuality basically, and I think that's the. Then I think what I would do is, if I were you, I'd be I'd go through go start on Google Scholar or or on the net or whatever, or. Um, I mean, uh, looking at the core text would be valuable here as well. One of the, that that text I've recommended, Seven Theories of Religion. I think it's Nine Theories of Religion now, actually, by Daniel Powell. There's a chapter in there on psychoanalysis. So that would be a good place to start and try and, you know, look up some, what some secondary scholars have said about the comparison of, of Freud and Jung. So you have your, 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 you have your four, three or four sections there. Uh, next, uh, so as one of my questions, so evaluate David Hume's account of religion in the dialogue concerning natural religion. So um, what you need to talk about here is David Hume. You need to talk about David Hume's empiricism. How is empiricism informs the psychology? And then how that, that would be your first section. That leads in then to offering a detailed summary of the dialogues concerning natural religion. So uh, what you need to do there is I, I would I, I think just, you know, to get sort of the description, the sort of the, the conceptual description in, you're going to have to talk about, um, well, what the different thinkers have, uh, so what the different sort of protagonists and dialogues concerning natural religion represent. So what does Philo represent? What does Cleanthes uh, represent and so on? And uh, outline what their positions are, uh, what they represent even any ambiguities in the text and i think the uh, the 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 idea is to say what is hume's critique of the idea that religion is sort of rational i mean what hume means by that is that uh, the idea that we can offer a sort of rational defense of the existence of god that's what sort of philo is in the, in, in the book is doing he's a skeptic who's trying to uh, attack sort of notions of causality and uh, you know intelligent design so I'll try and be as thorough as possible on that and then I think um, you could um, you could uh, you could uh, then offer an evaluation which is the first sort of keyword there where uh, Hume is uh, uh, you know you have to sort of say is, is, is well is what Hume's saying um, sensible is it reasonable and for what reasons what reasons might it not be why does Hume offer tenable arguments uh, in this or why are he, is his arguments weak for example now the next question is also a question on Hume should we believe in reports of the occurrence of uh, miracles discuss with reference to David Hume and I think what you need to do there is again it's a similar question but there's it's looking at a different a different a different a different aspect so um the the, the 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 key text there is uh, David Hume's book on miracles. It's a short book. You can probably get it in some of his, 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 his at the back of some of his bigger books, or you'll be able to get it online. And uh, I think um, the question there is: Should we believe in reports of the occurrence of miracles? Now, that's what you're answering: yes or no is is, is the question, or maybe I suppose you could say you could argue, but um, clearly for Hume, he's sceptical about the reportage of occurrence of miracles. So what you're going to need to do is outline um, the uh, the um, the argument that Hume offers in uh, of, of of miracles. So the first thing I would do is explain again Hume's empiricism, you know. How Hume sort of sees us, uh, the idea that all knowledge is derived from sense experience, and then that then creates, that generates the type of psychology we have, and that type of psychology then sort of leads to questions of anthropomorphism. So you can start very general, talking about Hume's empiricism and his psychology, and how that lays the groundwork for this uh, argument about miracles, so uh, that he makes. 
and then try and be give a, a, as thorough a possible account of the different sceptical questions he raises about the nature of miracles. Um, I think if you want a sort of a counter-argument there, someone you might potentially look at is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called, I think it was called On Miracles, but uh, I think in the first chapter he sort of challenges David Hume's argument. So that might be that might be a useful sort of counterpoint to use if you're if you if you fancy doing that question. Next, uh, another one of my questions. So it's outlined Daniel Dennis' evolutionary account of religion from breaking the spell. Okay, the value of what are doing Dennis' argument is tenable. So tenable basically means I'd probably use that word a bit. Tenable basically means whether it's 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 coherent, whether it's possible, whether it's viable. Okay. So the first Part of the question is relatively straightforward. Outlines Dennett's outline, so summarize Dennett's evolutionary account of religion from breaking the spell. So what you're really doing there is giving a summary, you know, as much as you can and as thorough as you can in this shorter spa space of time of what Dennett says in breaking the spell. Now, I mean, the most important thing I think there that you're going to have to explain is that for Dennett, religion is one. Uh, it's it's a natural phenomenon. Religion is, is something that is can be explained in natural terms or material terms. And then the next point is that that has to be done in, in terms of an evolutionary account. So what Din is saying basically in Brain Cell is why is religion a why is religion of evolutionary value? Right? And you can go through the examples he talks about this. I mean, you're gonna to have to try and be selective, I guess, and that's okay, you know. Try and get to the core points that Dinnett is uh, talking about. So, you know, he talks about, um, you know, how sort of evolution is helpful for survival, how religion is useful for stewardship, how religion is useful a for giving us a sort of pastor-like figures or custodian figures, you know, you know, sort of authoritative figures, because the ultimate answer is ultimately because religion helps us survive. And for Dennis, you know, that's why he's an atheist, I guess, is that religion is not something that is, you know, it doesn't have a separate reality. It doesn't have a supernatural reality. Religion can, is, is always explainable in, evolu in evolutionary terms, in evolutionary terms. And then um, the second part of the question then is, you know, you're going to have to look up and evaluate again, evaluate. Evaluate means, you know, assess or give reasons for why you think then its argument about the nature of religion might be compelling or why might it be reasonable or maybe you don't think it is maybe you think there's limitations um, and then you're gonna have to try and sort of do some research on what those limitations might be you know um yeah, so uh, evaluate whether then its argument is tenable so that's again basically that's sort of the critical dimension of I mean, a, lot, a lot of these questions you know the thing is to try and get a try and get a, 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 a you know a lot of these questions have, have the sort of the structure built into them so this is outline so there that gives you you know give you a summary of, of what Dinnett has to say what he's to say about religion in breaking the spell also probably darwin's dangerous idea might be a, a book that you should have in your bibliography especially the opening chapters and evaluate uh, is, you know, what are, you know, is basically provide a critical response to what Dinnett has to say. The second half of the question is the element that will sort of elevate you up the grade bands. OK, next. Um, OK, so critically assess Soren Kierkegaard's analysis uh, of Abram's test of faith in fear and trembling. Right. So, um, so the, the the Kierkegaard questions are sort of there's two Kierkegaard questions. Let me highlight them here for you. Now, um, well, the Kierkegaard questions, right, are different. So that you've, I mean, you're going to be answering these questions in the same way. It, it's just that the way I've sort of designed them is that you know, if you wanted to focus on fear and trembling and do it on a single text, then that's okay, right. Or if you want to have a more general answer on Kierkegaard, then probably question eight would be better. How does Kierkegaard approach the question of religion, religious faith? Now, um, I mean, in both questions, you're going to probably be talking about sort of the example of Abraham. But uh, in question seven, um, 
it's uh, it's going to be you're going to have, you have you're going to be focusing much more. So in question seven, the most important thing is that you're going to have to read Fear and Trembling, which is a short book. It's short but difficult. Short but difficult. Um, and uh, you're going to have to provide a summary of what uh, Kierkegaard says about Abraham in that in that in 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 that primary text. And of course. What you're going to try and explain in that essay is why is Abraham such a significant figure for Kierkegaard? And of course, the the the, the reason he thinks Kirk, Abraham is significant is because, well, it's it's because of 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 his acceptance of faith, sort of the reality of faith. Faith is something uncertain, you know. Faith is something that transcends knowledge, or the idea that sort of belief is something which uh, allows uh, elevates us beyond sort of the mere rational accounts of the world right so all of those themes will have to come into it um also i think what's important there is you know there's two other points that you need to talk about in that question is sort of the teleological suspension of the ethical and also i think you could offer some backdrop there where you talk about the different stages on life's way that kierkegaard uh talks about you know, the idea of, you know, the aesthetic, the ethical, I mean, and the and the religious stage. I mean, indeed, each of those could be a particular section of the essay. OK, so uh, and I think who. Yeah. So Claire Carlyle, I would re- recommend Claire Carlyle's books on Kierkegaard are very good, a very, very a good place to start. So uh, Claire Carlyle. So I think it's Kierkegaard, the guide for the perplexed is one of them. Uh I think, and also there's the Oxford very short introduction to Kierkegaard would be, I can't recall, uh, I think it was Gardner, I think was the, the author of that. I can't recall 100%, but I think that's right. Um, a very short introduction. So that I would start with those and then move, maybe move to the primary text and then see if you can find anything else on it. Now, the second question is a bit more general. How does Kierkegaard approach the question of religious faith? So again, you could answer that question using the stages on life way. The, you know, each of them could be a section in your essay. Uh, the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. All of it kind of leads up to the religious for Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard sort of thinks, well, you know, he doesn't really say this, but the the, the sort of he's characterized at least as advocating a leap of faith. You know, that faith is something. You know, faith and uncertainty and sort of mysterious are dimensions of human experience, and you know, for Kierkegaard, ultimately, they're sort of a richer form of human experience than knowledge that sort of we gain from sort of the aesthetic or the ethical stage stage so you could use those you can also use abram in there abram sort of in the story of uh, abram and isaac and the idea that Kirk, uh, sort of isaac or sort of abram has to transcend the sort of religious community in order to affirm uh, the religious um so yeah so that question is is, is is sort of a bit more general and again you're going to try and uh say i mean the the answer there is a bit more specific is kierkegaard successful is his account of religion successful is this idea of sort of religion as sort of pure faith as pure affirmation is that tenable is that uh, persuasive okay um now ah yes so question nine and okay so well question nine ten and eleven right so what we got here is um these are three questions so the, th- the trouble with these questions is that they come later in the year the lectures come later in the year, so um, what I have done is I have put up some podcasts on um, on on this um, on on the relevant part of now and sort of uh, in the in the sections uh, on teaching materials. So if there's if you go to the section on sort of Martin Buber, there'll be um, a question on 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 that, and there'll be a podcast lecture if you want to do these questions first. Also for these, if anyone's interested in doing them. And uh, do come see me. Um, so, um, okay, so the first question, question nine, construct a critical description of the general tenets of mystical uh, theology. So what we're going to be talking about there is mysticism. So you're asked to sort of look at mysticism, define mysticism uh, using maybe one or two. I won't go beyond two uh, examples of mysticism. Now we'll be we'll do a couple on the course. We'll we'll do Buber and we'll do Andre Comte-Swanville. You're free to try and find other mystics as well if you want. So Martin Buber is a Jewish mystic. Andre Comte-Swanville is an atheist mystic. Um, and I mean, there's tons of others you you could talk about. Uh, um, I don't know Teresa of Avila or Joan of Arc 
or John of the Cross, any of these, if you want to, if you want to look into what mysticism is. And of course, mysticism, you know, I mean, what you're doing there, there's lots of different mysticism. So what you're going to try and have to do is look at the, what are the general tenets of mysticism. So what you're trying to, what I'm asking you there is to try and find what are the common denominators of what mystical theology is. And there's a couple of things there that you certainly need to be hitting, right? So you could use your, your, um, you know, you can use your, the different philosophers to give examples of it. But what you're explaining, um, you know, you construct a critical description of the general tenets of mystical theology. So what are you hitting there? You're going to need to hit um, the idea that sort of, you know, mysticism kind of sits strangely with sort of existing uh, religions, you know. Now, lots of religions have mystics within them, but it's not always uh, the case that they, they that they, that they're like sort of official uh, sort of doctrine, right? Um, I think uh, you know uh, w another thing that you could talk about there is sort of perhaps the feeling of the oceanic. I mean, that's another thing that sort of defines mysticism is the sense of the uh, sort of pantheism or the idea that there is a profound interconnection between all things. You know that the universe is one. I, I mean, you you probably see you'll see elements of that in Plato or Plotinus, one of some of the ancient philosophers, right? Um. And I suppose another thing that you're talking about there is is the word theology. Is mysticism a theology? Is it a successful theology? Can it even be called a theology? Many would argue that it's not. You know, so I mean, I, I think you were, we were talking about it last week about uh, Meister Eckhart. He says, no, no, kind of, he's kind of says we have to do a sort of a negative uh, theology. Um, the sort of the more critical aspect of that question then is uh, basically asking you to, you know, well, asking you to construct an argument about the relative merits of sort of mystical theology, you know, why might it be plausible? Why might people follow it? Why might people find it appealing or attractive? Why might it be nonsense? You know, why? What are the sort of the the what do people what do people who criticize sort of mysticism uh, say uh, about it? Uh, okay, now the next question is on uh, Martin Buber, and what does he mean by an I Tao relationship? So, this question is uh, well, this question is uh, a lot like the first. So, there's a lot of overlap in some of these, right? So, to give you the freedom to do something you like. So, this is more specifically about uh, the Jewish mystic Martin Buber. So, the first part of that essay would be you would have to explain what Buber is um, is uh, talking about. Well, what does he mean by an I Tao relationship? Um, so firstly, you know, describe his mystic what mysticism is more generally. Then the second section could be, well, how does Buber fit in with that? And then thirdly, what is specific about Buber's Jewish mysticism? And then uh, you would need to offer a detailed explanation of what Buber says in his, his book I Thou. So in basically in his book I Thou, he 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 talks about what I thou relationships are and what I it relationships are. So I it relationships are basically relationships to things, and I thou relationships are relationships we have with um well with the cosmos really, I suppose, with the the totality of reality. Yeah. And the more sort of I thou relationships we have, uh the better. Um again, um now, uh, the next question is um so I'll start at the second uh so uh, the next question again is again starts with a general sort of discussion of mysticism, but here we're we're, we're looking at a sort of Andre Comte's book of atheist spirituality. So what you need to do in that when you're answering that question is provide a summary of uh, that book. All right, that's that's your sort of bread and butter answer. That's the thing that'll get you to the low to. And if you can offer a clear, detailed exposition of the argument that Comte's Bonville puts in the book of atheist spirituality, that will see you right. Um, so it's 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 not a big book. Um, you you uh, you'll have to read the primary text. It's about um, I think it's about three chapters. So you're going to be summarizing those. And the critical response here is a bit more specific, right? So what 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 Comte's Bonville is proposing is that he says one can be an atheist and be a mystic at the same time, right? So it's a very distinct type of atheism he's offering. Now I think you're more sort of traditional materialist or empirical philosopher such as you know like Daniel Dennett or Richard Dawkins they would have nothing to do with this this, this is not atheism this is just sort of covert spirituality right but what uh, what Comte's Bonville's argument is in contrast to that he says that you can be an atheist 
um, because you're not worshiping any particular theological gods. Okay, that's his that's his argument. You're not, you know, so so his point, I suppose, would be that Dawkins and the Dunes of the world are rejecting sort of uh, personal gods, or you know, the sort of the gods of theology. You know, the gods that are sort of omnipotent, omnivalent, and uh, omniscient, and all of those uh, classifications that we assign to them. And in a sense, what he's saying is that no. What he means by spirituality is a sort of our disposition to towards nature. So he's a kind of a pantheist, I suppose. So that's you know, and that's what you're going to try and say. Is that is that is that a tenable position? It's a very unique position that Combs Bonville has got. Um, but I think the jury might be out on whether we can call it an atheist spirituality. Combs Bonville thinks we can. Now, okay. So the next question: Are science and religion necessarily uh, opposed? So this is a nice open question. So you can you the way to tackle this is you can sort of um, construct an answer based on thinkers on the course, right? You know, so you could if you're on the science side of things, I guess you could look at sort of people like Dennis or Hume, or you know, if you wanted to look at sort of someone like Richard Dawkins, and th I, I think the pro right. So with all questions, right, you need to move from the general to the specific, general to the specific, always, and I think what I would to do that in this question so this question is quite general so or there's a danger of becoming too general and you don't want that that's what so well that, lower, that will lower your marks right um you know the more the more general answers we get they tend to be you know um you know they tend to get less less marks because you're not getting into the nitty-gritty of the of the of the arguments and how the arguments link together and how the arguments unfold so what i would recommend there is uh I think, you know, you're going to need to find someone, you may need to kind of explain why science and religion might necessarily be opposed, right? I mean, uh, you know, it's so like, you know, so someone like Daniel Dennett give a sort of a detailed summary of what he has to say, for example, or a similar philosopher like Richard Dawkins, why do they think science and religion might necessarily be opposed? Why is the method of science opposed to sort of religious uh, experience? Uh, I think another... Another philosopher that we studied in the course there was, uh, what's his name? Uh, I think it's Stephen Jay Gould. Um, well, well, you know, he talks about sort of overlapping, non-overlapping magisteria and things like that. You could look at that. Um, you could, uh, and the, or you could look at people like um, sort of McIntyre might be useful there. Um, or you could look at... Um, uh, the chap Chet Ramo uh, he's wrote a book years ago called Skeptics and True Believers and he's he's someone who tries to argue that religion and uh, science can overlap um, I think the point would be again there to try and exp you know try you're trying to sort of give someone an answer that's representative of science and the scientific method and you're trying to say can science and religion overlap I think I think that's the question that's happening there and where might they overlap? That's, you know, we we do see a lot of this in sort of physics. You know, a lot of people sort of take physics as, you know, as 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 demonstrable of as as, as demonstrating rather, you know, sort of mystical or theological elements of 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 of, of, of reality, right? So, but I mean, again, th that question ha it has to be balanced. It has to be balanced. You have to try and give each position it's due but try and not let it sort of lapse into the general okay but and you can do that then by you know using specific examples of philosophers who who answer that question um okay so uh, question 13 um okay so we got uh, two we got two um nietzschean questions here uh, and in a sense I mean, the the key thing here is you're going to have to explain Nietzsche. That's your sort of core knowledge that you're going to have to explain and express well. Um, does Nietzsche... So, firstly, what is nihilism? That's more specific. So, you're going to have to do... There, you're going to have to answer what is nihilism, you know? Uh, what does it mean? What does it... How can you define it? And then you're going to have to say specifically, that could be your opening section, what does... How does Nietzsche respond to this? So famously, I think Nietzsche says that there's active and passive nihilism, so you have to explain those. Uh, and of course, the most important thing, because this is a philosophy of religion model, model module, uh, what you're going to have to do there is explain why Nietzsche thinks that... Um, why Nietzsche thinks that... Uh, that 
the God is dead. What does Nietzsche mean by the God is dead? What is this lament he has for the death of God? Right? You're going to have to explain that. And, uh, you know, that's kind of in the gay science. And, um, you know, then the second half of the question, you're going to have to answer more specifically. Well, I mean, the answer is kind of in that second half of the question. Does Nietzsche provide the antidote to nihilism? Is, he, is, is Nietzsche's response to the question of nihilism valuable? Does he, in fact, you know, offer a compelling alternative, you know, to a world where God is dead? And that's effectively what Nietzsche is asking is like, how can we have meaning and purpose in a godless world? And of course, Nietzsche offers, you know, I mean, it'll be very important to talk about his critique of Christianity um, and slave morality. But also, what are the alternatives that Nietzsche offer? You know, what does he mean by Ubermensch? And what does he mean by, explain what he means by sort of will to power? Or explain what he means by Amor Fati? Or uh, what other Nietzschean concepts you think are relevant? Um, and, you know, does he provide an antidote to nihilism? That's, an, that's a nice kind of question, actually, because in a sense, Nietzsche saw himself as a, he saw himself as sort of a therapist of culture and sort of nihilism as the sickness of the age or the sickness of the future, right? Uh, which leads on to the next question. But, uh, you know, does is, is Nietzsche's alternative tenable? Now, the next question, is Nietzsche the pro chief prophet of, the, of our age? Now, uh, yes. So, again, what I've said for question 13 goes for this. You're going to have to describe Nietzsche and this. You're going to have to explain that core knowledge, right? Um, now, again, the, what you need to be sort of mindful of this question is that it, you need to move from the general to the specific, always, in everything you do, in every sort of philosophy question, always move from the general to the specific. Does this become more specific, right? So in that question, you have to explain Nietzsche, um, explain, explain all the things I already said, in fact, and then answer this question here. Is he, is he the prophet of our age? Or do other thinkers fit that bill? And I won't go too much into other thinkers there I would maybe sort of refer you could possibly refer to Marx or Freud maybe you could think maybe René Girard or McIntyre are are more more valuable because what's being asked there is a uh, is Nietzsche's depiction of nihilism and his response to nihilism does it offer uh well does it offer I guess a a, a tenable diagnosis of contemporary times right and I mean you know, I mean, Nietzsche gets Nietzsche is often def 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 described as a great prophet of the twentieth century, but we're not in the twentieth century. We're in the twenty-first century. So, do, is Nietzsche becoming more relevant? There, that's what you should be answering there. Now, um, I like this question as well. When Neil questions, what is postmodern theology? So, um, okay. So, what you're going to have to do there, I think, is right. You're going. This is again a sort of another Nietzschean question, right? So. And probably going to the first section that is just going to be on Nietzsche, but you're not going to have to go into as much detail as you did in the last questions as you did, uh, as I said, well, on Nietzsche. But first, explain what generally what Nietzsche is about and what is his influence on postmodern theology, right? So Nietzsche and postmodernism would be your first question there. How does Nietzsche feed into postmodern uh, thinking? You know, how does does he influence Foucault or Lyotard or Derrida or any of these thinkers? You know, remember in the seminar we talked about how Lyotard was the well, Leotard is the, uh, you know, the idea of the incredulity towards meta-narrative, right? Now, that's, that's, you can, that would be your opening section, but the, the, the key word here is postmodern theology. So now, in the class, we studied a lot of thinkers who, you know, um, a lot of postmodern theologians. So you're going to have to talk about them. So, for example, like one of the people who studied would be Don Cupid. So you would have to outline what he means by postmodern theology and how he, he fits that bill um and then the next question is that um so is it atheism in disguise so that's kind of the more critical question that you're answering is is this all this postmodern theology stuff just atheism remember i think if you look at the seminar notes i sent you on this it'll be helpful also but uh, i think the, sort of the, the, the criticism and as some of you mentioned this in class as well of postmodern theology is it kind of like substance right that it's you know that you can't really have religion if it doesn't refer to the things that religion refers to you know like god or faith or you know ritual and practice and all of these things that sort of religions do right and uh i suppose i think i think that's from i think yeah so i think uh, i think the idea there is that it's is this just another form of atheism you know is it sort of religion without the content right and you know 
I mean, I suppose that's kind of what Cupid is talking about, you know, the idea that, you know, we can kind of sort of cherry pick what we want from religion and sort of leave the sort of the religious reality of it. And um, in class, we sort of discussed that, you know, that's kind of the appeal of sort of postmodern theology. That it's, you know, it's it's kind of flexible and non-dogmatic. So that's kind of the opposing arguments there, you know, that you're going to have to try and um, explain and uh, balance out and offer an argument uh, as to whether it is, in fact, atheism in disguise. Next question, Gerard, we haven't done him uh, at this point, right? Um, but uh, Gerard, really interesting philosopher. So, um, again, this question, so what Gerard does is, um, I'm not sure if you could put him in the postmodern theology um um, sort of camp but he certainly is offering a response to Nietzsche so the first part of that question that you'll be answering is explaining what Gerard has to say about uh, Nietzsche so he think he, again all these postmodern theologians take Nietzsche seriously they take Nietzsche very very seriously um, and I think what uh, what Gerard's point is is that uh we should take Nietzsche seriously, but we have to realise, he says, that Christianity, uh, and I guess for him that would be Catholicism, offer uh, uh, a, a response to the challenge that Nietzsche puts down, right? So, and I think, and I think in a sense, he thinks that uh, Nietzsche gets it, is, is right up to a point, but he gets it wrong in terms of understanding how we ought to well, respond to sort of uh, questions of sacrifice and questions of religion. So, I think I think the things the things that you're basically going to have to talk about there are you're going to have to explain what Gerard means by religion. You're going to have to explain what he means by sacrifice. You're going to have to explain what he means by the scapegoat mechanism, and you're going to have to explain what he means by mimesis. Now, we'll do all of the we'll talk about all of this stuff in class when it comes up. Um, uh, I think basically, sort of Girard's point is that you know, that 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 sort of religion historically has been very very sort of violent and sacrificial, uh, and what Christianity does then is it Christianity is a uh, I guess for Girard a, a, a progress because it draws attention to this this uh, sort of this violent and sacrificial nature. So sort of the idea is that sort of the the, the 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 sort of the figure of Jesus Christ basically tries to sort of uh, diminish the impact of sort of violence and sacrifice. So there are all the themes that you would have to be hitting there. And uh, again, um, I mean, you answer the question there: Is there a relationship between religion and sacrifice? Right. So for Gerard, yes, absolutely, there is. But uh, Christianity is, I guess, got a, an exceptional status in that because it. Because it, uh, it 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 tries to challenge, um, well, violence. There are the relationship between religion and violence, um, and yeah, and also try and give a sort of a you know be be evaluative and critical there. Now, question seventeen: In modern societies, in modern societies, are we becoming more or less religious? Um, now, again, sort of very, very general question, right? But that question is designed to ask you about philosophy or, I guess, philosophers of religion specifically, right? So that's how you would answer that question. Using thinkers from the course who would say that um, we are becoming more or less religious. Now, you could perfectly well start that essay by talking about uh, finding evidence about whether religion is becoming more amplified or whether it's becoming less amplified, I mean, it's hard to answer that sort of in an even way because maybe maybe in Western societies we're becoming more secular, but, you know, maybe across the world we're not becoming more secular. Maybe we're becoming more religious, um, you know. Um, and I think what you need to do is use philosophers. So pick a philosopher, preferably a philosopher from the course because you'll have the materials on it, and ask, are we becoming more or less religious? Are we becoming more secular? So some of the philosophers on the course that could be useful in answering that question are Weber, the question of secularization. Um, Charles Taylor would be an interesting philosopher to look at there. He wrote a book called The Secular Age. Um, that would be, in fact, that would be a very, very good book. Um, it's, it's a bit of a chunk, right? So it's a big book. So try and be very focused in your reading. Um, now, that doesn't mean you don't get to read a good chunk of it either. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do appreciate it. It's... Um, a large book. <laughs> uh, um, uh, who else? McIntyre. Uh, the question in the next uh, in the next book would be uh, 
would be would be valuable there now again general to the specific general to the specific right uh, i think macadar could be a good one there actually really because you know so you start general talking about in contemporary societies are we becoming more or less religious and then how do philosophers respond to that question you know say for example how does macintyre respond to that question you know i think that's what he calls it the moral barbarism of the age you know so i guess that's what he means by we're becoming more we're becoming less religious and therefore we're becoming less well virtuous for him i suppose um next question outline and assess the significance of macintyre's critique of modernity okay um so again the key words here outline summarize and assess evaluate the significance so uh, the key book there that you're going to have to summarize is uh after virtue uh, i recommend you read that um it's a big book but it's um it's it's, it's pretty well written and it's, he's, he's he's pretty clear and there's lots of videos of him on youtube and things like that if you want to get more more into him um and i think really what you're going to have to explain there is how is what is mcintyre's sort of critique of modernity you know sort of critique of secularism that's sort of your first section or two or two sections and then what, how does he retrieve Aristotle? That's what he's, well, what's McIntyre's point is. Like, you know, we need to return to Aristotle. We need to return to sort of traditions of wisdom and virtue. Um, sort, of, sort, of, sort of, he talks about sort of Christian monasticism. He talks about Aristotle. And for him, we need to sort of revitalize that in order to respond to the negative consequences of uh, modernity and secularity and, and, and so on. Uh, okay. And the final question. Uh, this is a really nice question. This is a tough one to answer. This, right? But some of you might f fancy the challenge: Is belief in God rational? Right? Okay. So again, general to specific. You're going to have to to answer that. So answer the question. That's going to be in your conclusion. Do you think that believing in God is rational? Now, the obvious point here is that we would say no. That belief in God is not rational. You know, the idea is that sort of traditionally the critiques of religion or the, the critiques of religion to say it comes from Dennett, you know, and then from the naturalist and empirical tradition are that it is utterly irrational to believe in uh, God. You know, the idea that God is absurd, supernatural or nonsensical, right? Okay, so you can explain all that in, in pretty much one section, right? But then you're going to have to ask yourself, well, why might belief in God be rational? You know, Kierkegaard certainly doesn't think that you know, for sure. But there are lots of thinkers, you know, lots of philosophers and theologians that you can find who thinks that belief in God is perfectly rational, you know. So, for example, uh, you could think of St. Anselm there. St. Anselm, uh, in his famous proofs of God's existence, that is a rational argument, right? You might not agree with it, or you might not think it's tenable, although it's pretty hard to disprove, uh, but it is, in fact, a rationally well-structured um argument you could do it i mean there's there's many ways of doing this you could do you could you could you could uh, you could you could do a sort of a critical response to this you could use nietzsche and say well actually no sort of the sort of belief in god is a sort of a is a is a sort of a sort of a, a hangover of, of 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 sort of platonic thinking or whatever or you could use marx for example is belief in god rational and sort of marx of course would say um well no um um, belief in God is not rational. Belief in God is uh, sort of a, a a response to a cruel and unjust world. Um, in fact, that would be a really good question to use to answer if you wanted to talk about uh, Marx. You know, it's a really, really good uh, question where you could say, okay, belief in God is not rational, but it's sort of a, determined by material and economic uh, uh, forces. So, as you can see there, again very general question but the answer will probably need to be a bit more specific and you are going to have to try and say well what reasons do we think that might belief in god be rational you know uh, i think sort of i think who was it one of the popes um i can't i think it was john paul ii i'm not entirely sure there's been so many of them recently um i think he said uh sort of faith seeking understanding right fide sed ratio i think was the is the is the encyclical uh, which you should be able to find online and that'd be that would be a really good example of a, a theologian who sort of says that you can sort of blend um, your theology and your philosophy of religion with um, uh, with, uh, with, with, with rationality, right? Um, yeah, so it's a quite an open question, but again, general to specific. So, you know, pick a philosopher, maybe two at the most, uh, and construct an answer to that question. Okay, so... Uh, 
that is a um, that is some feedback on how to go about answering the questions. I suggest uh, you. It's very important that you submit uh, a draft coming up, um, or you can come see me during office hours. Um, uh, well, we only have one more week of that, um, but I'll be available. So one more week of office hours, which is next week, but I will be available all the way up to Christmas. So pr well, pretty much. So I don't think we finish until so like the 23rd or 24th or something like that. So I'll be on emails if you have any particular queries on that. But I think the main thing is please, please, please submit an essay or a draft essay to the Dropbox. And um, even if you don't get a chance to do it, um, you know, at least even submit a plan. Because if you give me feedback, it'll help make things better. And then we can sort of meet up uh, when we reconvene in, uh, in the new year. Okay. Uh, talk soon.